This audio production was made in collaboration with Audible Anarchist. The Russian Tragedy by Alexander Berkman Chapter 1 It is most surprising how little is known outside of Russia about the actual situation and the conditions prevailing in that country. Even intelligent persons, especially among the workers, have the most confused ideas about the character of the Russian Revolution, its development, and its present political, economic, and social status. Understanding of Russia and of what has been happening there since 1917 is most inadequate, to say the least. Though the great majority of people side either with or against the revolution, speak for or against the Bolsheviks, Yet almost nowhere is there concrete knowledge and clarity in regard to the vital subjects involved. Generally speaking, the views expressed, friendly or otherwise, are based on very incomplete and unreliable, frequently entirely false information about the Russian Revolution, its history, and the present phase of the Bolshevik regime. But not are the opinions entertained founded, as a rule, on insufficient or wrong data. Too often, they are deeply colored, properly speaking distorted, by partisan feeling, personal prejudice, and class interests. On the whole, it is sheer ignorance in one form or another which characterizes the attitude of the great majority of people towards Russia and Russian events. And yet, understanding of the Russian situation is most vital to the future progress and well-being of the world. On the correct estimation of the Russian Revolution, the role played in it by the Bolsheviks and by other political parties and movements, and the causes that have brought about the present situation, in short, on a thorough conception of the whole problem, depends what lessons we shall draw from the great historic events of 1917. Those lessons will, for good or evil, affect the opinions and the activities of great masses of mankind, in other words, coming social changes and the labor and revolutionary efforts preceding and accompanying them will be profoundly, essentially influenced by the popular understanding of what has really happened in Russia. It is generally admitted that the Russian Revolution is the most important historic event since the Great French Revolution. I am even inclined to think that, in point of its potential consequences, the Revolution of 1917 is the most significant fact in the whole known history of mankind. It is the only revolution which aimed de facto at social world revolution. It is the only one which actually abolished the capitalist system on a countrywide scale and fundamentally altered all social relationships existing till then. An event of such human and historic magnitude must not be judged from the narrow viewpoint of partisanship. No subjective feeling or preconception should be consciously permitted to color one's attitude. Above all, every phase of the revolution must be carefully studied, without bias or prejudice, and all the facts dispassionately considered to enable us to form a just and adequate opinion. I believe, I am firmly convinced, that only the whole truth about Russia, irrespective of any considerations whatever, can be of ultimate benefit. Unfortunately, such has not been the case so far as a general rule. It was natural, of course, for the Russian Revolution to arouse bitterest antagonism on the one hand and most passionate defense on the other, but partisanship of whatever camp is not an objective judge. To speak plainly, the most atrocious lies, as well as ridiculous fairy tales, have been spread about Russia, and are continuing to be spread, even at this late day. Naturally, it is not to be wondered at that the enemies of the Russian Revolution, the enemies of revolution as such, the reactionaries and their tools, should have flooded the world with most venomous misrepresentation of events transpiring in Russia. About them and their information, I need not waste any further words. In the eyes of honest, intelligent people, they are discredited long ago. But, sad to state, it is the would-be friends of Russia and of the Russian Revolution who have done the greatest harm to the revolution, to the Russian people, and to the best interests of the working masses of the world, by their exercise of zeal untempered by truth. Some unconsciously, but most of them consciously and intentionally, have been lying, persistently and cheerfully, in defiance of all facts, in the mistaken notion that they are helping the revolution. Reasons of political expediency, of Bolshevik diplomacy, of the alleged necessity of the hour, and frequently motives of less unselfish considerations have actuated them. The sole decent consideration of decent men, of real friends of the Russian Revolution and of man's emancipation, as well as of reliable history, consideration for truth, they have entirely ignored.
There have been honorable exceptions, unfortunately too few. Their voice has almost been lost in the wilderness of misrepresentation, falsehood, and overstatement. But most of those who visited Russia simply lied about the conditions in that country. I repeat it deliberately. Some lied because they did not know any better. They had neither the time nor the opportunity to study the situation, to learn the facts. They made flying trips, spending ten days or a few weeks in Petrograd or Moscow, unfamiliar with the language, never for a moment coming in direct touch with the real life of the people, hearing and seeing only what was told or shown them by the interested officials accompanying them at every step. In many cases, these students of the revolution were veritable innocents abroad, naive to the point of the ludicrous. So unfamiliar were they with the environment that in most cases they had not even the faintest suspicion that their affable interpreter, so eager to show and explain everything, was in reality a member of the trusted men, specially assigned to guide important visitors. Many such visitors have since spoken and written voluminously about the Russian Revolution with little knowledge and less understanding. Others there were who had the time and the opportunity, and some of them really tried to study the situation seriously, not merely for the purpose of journalistic copy. During my two years' stay in Russia, I had occasion to come in personal contact with almost every foreign visitor, with the labor missions, and with practically every delegate from Europe, Asia, America, and Australia who gathered in Moscow to attend the International Communist Congress held there last year, 1921. Most of them could see and understand what was happening in the country, but it was a rare exception indeed that had vision and courage enough to realize that only the whole truth could serve the best interests of the situation. As a general rule, however, the various visitors to Russia were extremely careless of the truth, systematically so, the moment they began enlightening the world. Their assertions frequently bordered on criminal idiocy. Think, for instance, of George Lansbury, publisher of the London Daily Herald, stating that the ideas of brotherhood, equality, and love preached by Jesus the Nazarene were being realized in Russia, and at that very same time when Lenin was deploring the necessity of military communism forced upon us by allied intervention and blockade. Consider the equality that divided the population of Russia into 36 categories according to the ration and wages received. Another Englishman, a noted writer, emphatically claimed that everything would be well in Russia were it not for outside interference while whole districts in the east, the south, and in Siberia, some of them larger in area than France, were in armed rebellion against the Bolsheviks and their agrarian policy. Other literati were extolling the free Soviet system of Russia, while 18,000 of her sons lay dead at Kronstadt in the struggle to achieve free Soviets. But why enlarge upon this literary prostitution? The reader will easily recall to mind the legion of Ananiases who have been strenuously denying the very existence of the things that Lenin tried to explain as inevitable. I know that many delegates and others believed that the real Russian situation, if known abroad, might strengthen the hand of the reactionists and interventionists. Such a belief, however, did not necessitate the painting of Russia as a veritable labor El Dorado but the time when it might have been considered inadvisable to speak fully of the Russian situation is long past. That period has been terminated, relegated into the archives of history by the introduction of the new economic policy. Now the time has come when we must learn the full lesson of the revolution and the causes of its debacle, that we may avoid the mistakes it's made, Lenin frankly says they were many, that we may be enabled to adopt its best features, we must know the whole truth about Russia. It is therefore that I consider the activities of certain labor men as positively criminal and a betrayal of the true interests of the workers of the world. I refer to the men and women, some of them delegates to the Congresses held in Moscow in 1921, that still continue to propagate the friendly lies about Russia, delude the masses with roseate pictures of labor conditions in that country, and even seek to induce workers of other lands to migrate in large numbers to Russia. They are strengthening the appalling confusion already existing in the popular mind, deceive the proletariat by false statements of the present and vain promises for the near future. They are perpetuating the dangerous delusion that the revolution is alive and continuously active in Russia. It is most despicable tactics. Of course, it is easy for an American labor leader playing to the radical element to write glowing reports about the condition of the Russian workmen, while he is being entertained at state expense at the Lux, the most lucrative hotel in Russia. Indeed, he may insist that no money is needed, for does he not receive everything his heart desires free of charge? 
Or why should the president of an American needleworkers union not state the Russian workers enjoy full liberty of speech? He is careful not to mention that only communists and trustees were permitted within speaking distance while the distinguished visitor was investigating conditions in the factories. May history be merciful to them. Chapter 2 That the reader may form a just estimate of I think it necessary to sketch briefly my mental attitude at the time of my arrival in Russia. It was two years ago, a democratic government the freest on earth, had deported me, together with 248 other politicals from the country I had lived in over 30 years. I had protested emphatically against the moral wrong perpetrated by an alleged democracy in resorting to methods it had so vehemently condemned on the part of the czarist autocracy. I branded deportation of politicals as an outrage on the most fundamental rights of man, and I fought it as a matter of principle. But my heart was glad. Already at the outbreak of the February Revolution, I had yearned to go to Russia, but the Mooney case had detained me. I was loath to desert the fight. Then I myself was taken prisoner by the United States and penalized for my opposition to world slaughter. During two years, the enforced hospitality of the federal penitentiary at Atlanta, Georgia, prevented my departure. Deportation followed. My heart was glad, did I say? A weak word to express the passion of joy that filled me at the certainty of visiting Russia. Russia! I was going to the country that had swept Tsardom off the map. I was to behold the land of the social revolution. Could there be greater joy to one who in his very childhood had been a rebel against tyranny, whose youth's unformed dreams had visioned human brotherhood and happiness, whose entire life was devoted to the social revolution? The journey was an inspiration. Though we were prisoners, treated with military severity, and the Buford, a leaky old tub, repeatedly endangering our lives during the month's odyssey, Yet the thought that we were on the way to the land of revolutionary promise kept the whole company of deportees in high spirits, a tremble with expectations of the great day soon to come. Long, long was the voyage, shameful the conditions we were forced to endure, crowded below deck, living in constant wetness and foul air, fed on the poorest rations. Our patience was nigh exhausted, yet our courage unflagging, and at last we reached our destination. It was the 19th of January, 1920, when we touched the soil of Soviet Russia. The feeling of solemnity, of awe, almost overwhelmed me. Thus must have felt my pious old forefathers on first entering the Holy of Holies. A strong desire was on me to kneel down and kiss the ground, the ground consecrated by the lifeblood of generations of suffering and martyrdom, consecrated anew by the triumphant revolutionists of my own day. Never before, not even when released from the horrible nightmare of fourteen years' prison, had I been stirred so profoundly, longing to embrace humanity, to lay my heart at its feet, to give my life a thousand times, were it but possible, to the service of the social revolution. It was the most sublime day of my life. We were received with open arms. The revolutionary hymn, played by the military red band, greeted us enthusiastically as we crossed the Russian frontier. The hurrahs of the red-capped defenders of the revolution echoed through the woods, rolling into the distance like threats of thunder. With bowed head, I stood in the presence of the visible symbols of the revolution triumphant. With bowed head and bowed heart, my spirit was proud, yet meek with the consciousness of actual social revolution. What depths, what grandeur lay therein, what incalculable possibilities stretched in its vistas. I heard the still voice of my soul. May your past life have contributed, if ever so little, to the realization of the great human ideal, to this, its successful beginning and I became conscious of the great happiness it offered me to do, to work, to help with every fiber of my being the complete revolutionary expression of this wonderful people. They had fought and won. They proclaimed the social revolution. It meant that oppression had ceased, that submission and slavery, man's twin curses, were abolished. The hope of generations, of ages, has at last been realized. Justice has been established on the earth, at least on that part of it that was Soviet Russia, and never more shall the precious heritage be lost. But years of war and revolution have exhausted the country. There is suffering and hunger, and much need of stout hearts and willing hands to do and help. My heart sang for joy. I, I will give myself fully, completely, to the service of the people. I shall be rejuvenated and grow young again in ever greater effort, in the hardest toil, for the furtherance of the common weal. My very life will I consecrate to the realization of the world's greatest hope the social revolution. 
At the first Russian army outpost, a mass meeting was held to welcome us. The large hall crowded with soldiers and sailors, the nun-dressed women on the speaker's platform, their speeches, the whole atmosphere palpitating with revolution in action, all made a deep impression on me. Urged to say something, I thanked the Russian comrades for their warm welcome of the American deportees, congratulated them on their heroic struggle, and expressed my great joy at being in their midst. And then my whole thought and feeling fused into one sentence. Dear comrades, I said, we came not to teach but to learn, to learn and to help. Thus I entered Russia. Thus felt my fellow deportees. I remained two years. What I learned, I learned gradually, day by day, in various parts of the country. I had exceptional opportunities for observation and study. I stood close to the leaders of the Communist Party, associated much with the most active men and women, participated in their work, and traveled extensively through the country under conditions most favorable to personal contact with the lives of workers and peasants. At first, I could not believe that what I saw was real. I would not believe my eyes, my ears, my judgment. As those trick mirrors that make you appear dreadfully monstrous, so Russia seemed to reflect the revolution as a frightful perversion. It was an appalling caricature of the new life, the world's hope. I shall not go into detailed description of my first impressions, my investigations, and the long process that resulted in my final conviction. I fought relentlessly, bitterly, against myself. For two years I fought. It is hardest to convince him who does not want to be convinced, and I admit, I did not want to admit that the revolution in Russia had become a mirage, a dangerous deception. Long and hard I struggled against this conviction, yet proofs were accumulating, and each day brought more damning testimony. Against my will, against my hopes, against the holy fire of admiration and enthusiasm for Russia which burned within me, I was convinced. Convinced that the Russian revolution had been done to death. How? And by whom? Chapter 3 it has been asserted by some writers that Bolshevik ascension to power in Russia was due to a coup de main, and doubt has been expressed regarding the social nature of the October change. Nothing could be further from the truth. As a matter of historic fact, the great event known as the October Revolution was in the profoundest sense a social revolution. It was characterized by all the essentials of such a fundamental change. It was accomplished not by any political party, but by the people themselves, in a manner that radically transformed all the heretofore existing economic, political, and social relations. But it did not take place in October. That month witnessed only the formal legal sanction of the revolutionary events that had preceded it. For weeks and months prior to it, the actual revolution had been going on all over Russia. The city proletariat was taking possession of the shops and factories, while the peasants expropriated the big estates and turned the land to their own use. At the same time, workers' committees, peasants' committees, and Soviets sprang up all over the country, and there began the gradual transfer of power from the provisional government to the Soviets. That took place first in Petrograd, then in Moscow, and quickly spread to the Volga region, the Ural district, and to Siberia. The popular will found expression in the slogan, All Power to the Soviets, and it went sweeping through the length and breadth of the land. The people had risen. The actual revolution was on. The keynote of the situation was struck by the Congress of the Soviets of the North, proclaiming, The provisional government of Kerensky must go. The Soviets are the sole power. That was on October 10th. Practically all the real power was already with the Soviets. In July, the Petrograd rising against Kerensky was crushed. But in August, the influence of the revolutionary workers and of the garrison was strong enough to enable them to prevent the attack planned by Kornilov. The Petrograd Soviet gained strength from day to day. On October 16th, it organized its own revolutionary military committee, an act of defiance of an open challenge to the government. The Soviet, through its revolutionary military committee, prepared to defend Petrograd against the coalition government of Kerensky and the possible attack of General Kaledin and his counter-revolutionary Cossacks. On October 22nd, the whole proletarian population of Petrograd, solidarically supported by the garrison, demonstrated throughout the city against the government and in favor of all power to the Soviets. The All-Russian Congress of Soviets was to open October 25th. The provisional government, knowing its very existence in imminent peril, resorted to drastic action. 
On October 23rd, the Petrograd Soviet ordered the Kerensky cabinet to withdraw within 48 hours. Driven to desperation, Kerensky undertook on October 24th to suppress the revolutionary press, arrest the most prominent revolutionists of Petrograd, and remove the active commissars of the Soviet. The government relied on the faithful troops and the young junkers of the military student schools, but it was too late. The attempt to sustain the government failed. During the night of October 24th to 25th, November 6th to 7th, the Kerensky government was dissolved, peacefully, without bloodshed, and the exclusive supremacy of the Soviets was established. The Communist Party stepped into power. It was the political culmination of the Russian Revolution. Chapter 4 Various factors contributed to the success of the revolution. To begin with, it met with almost no active opposition. The Russian bourgeoisie was unorganized, weak, and not of a militant disposition. But the main reasons lay in the all-absorbing enthusiasm with which the revolutionary slogans had fired the whole people. Down with the war, immediate peace, the land to the peasant, the factory to the workers, all power to the Soviets. These were expressive of the passionate soul cry and deepest need of the great masses. No power could withstand their miraculous effect. Another very potent factor was the unity of the various revolutionary elements in their opposition to the Kerensky government. Bolsheviks, anarchists, the left faction of the Social Revolutionary Party, the numerous politicals freed from prison and Siberian exile, and the hundreds of returned revolutionary emigrants had all worked during the February to October months toward a common goal. But if it was easy to begin the revolution, as Lenin had said in one of his speeches, to develop it, to carry it to its logical conclusion, was another and more difficult matter. Two conditions were essential to such a consummation, continued unity of all the revolutionary forces, and the application of the country's goodwill initiative and best energies to the important work of the new social construction. It must always be remembered, and remembered well, that revolution does not mean destruction only, it means destruction plus construction, with the greatest emphasis on the plus. Most unfortunately, Bolshevik principles and methods were soon fated to prove a handicap, a drawback upon the creative activities of the masses. The Bolsheviks are Marxists. Though in the October days they had accepted and proclaimed anarchist watchwords, direct action by the people, expropriation, free Soviets, and so forth, it was not their social philosophy that dictated this attitude. They had felt the popular pulse, the rising waves of the revolution had carried them far beyond their theories but they remained Marxists. At heart, they had no faith in the people and their creative initiative. As social democrats, they distrusted the peasantry, counting rather upon the support of the small revolutionary minority among the industrial element. They had advocated the constituent assembly, and only when they were convinced that they would not have a majority there, and therefore not be able to take state power into their own hands, they suddenly decided upon the dissolution of the assembly, though the step was a refutation and a denial of fundamental Marxist principles. Incidentally, it was an anarchist, Anatoly Zhelezniakov, in charge of the palace guard, who took the initiative in the matter. As Marxists, the Bolsheviks insisted on the nationalization of the land, ownership, distribution, and control to be in the hands of the state. They were in principle opposed to socialization, and only the pressure of the left faction of the social revolutionists, the Spiridonova Kamkov wing, whose influence among the peasantry was traditional, forced the Bolsheviks to swallow the agrarian program of the social revolutionists whole, as Lenin afterwards put it. From the first days of their ascension to political power, the Marxist tendencies of the Bolsheviks began to manifest themselves to the detriment of the revolution. Social democratic distrust of the peasantry influenced their methods and measures. At the all-Russian conferences, the peasants did not receive equal representation with the industrial workers. Not only the village speculator and exploiter, but the agrarian population as a whole was branded by the Bolsheviks as petty bosses and bourgeois, unable to keep step with the proletariat on the road to socialism. The Bolshevik government discriminated against the peasant representatives in the Soviets and at the national conferences, sought to handicap their independent efforts, and systematically narrowed the scope and activities of the land commissariat, then by far the most vital factor in the reconstruction of Russia. The commissariat was then presided over by a left social revolutionist. Inevitably, this attitude led to much dissatisfaction on the part of the great peasant masses. The Russian mujik is simple and naive, but with the instinct of the primitive man he quickly senses a wrong. 
No fine dialectics can budge his once-settled conviction. The very cornerstone of the Marxist credo, the dictatorship of the proletariat, served as an affront and an injury to the peasantry. They demanded an equal share in the organization and administration of the country. Had they not been enslaved, oppressed, and ignored long enough? The dictatorship of the proletariat the peasant resented as discrimination against himself. If dictatorship must be, he argued, why not of all who labor, of the town worker and of the peasant, together? Then came the Brest-Litovsk peace. In its far-reaching results, it proved the death blow to the revolution. Two months previously, in December 1917, Trotsky had refused, with a fine gesture of noble indignation, the peace offered by Germany on conditions much more favorable to Russia. We wage no war, we sign no peace, he had said, and revolutionary Russia applauded him. No compromise with German imperialism, no concessions, echoed through the length and breadth of the country, and the people stood ready to defend their revolution to the very death. But now, Lenin demanded the ratification of a peace that meant the most mean-spirited betrayal of the greater part of Russia. Finland, Latvia, Lithuania, Ukraine, White Russia, Bessarabia, all were to be turned over to the oppression and exploitation of the German invader and of their own bourgeoisie. It was a monstrous thing, the sacrifice at once of the principles of the revolution and of its interests as well. Lenin insisted on ratification on the ground that the revolution needed a breathing spell, that Russia was exhausted, and that peace would enable the revolutionary oasis to gather strength for new effort. Radek denounced acceptance of Brest-Litovsk conditions as betrayal of the October Revolution. Trotsky disagreed with Lenin. The revolutionary forces split. The left social revolutionists, most of the anarchists, and many of the non-partisan revolutionary elements were bitterly opposed to making peace with imperialism, especially on the terms dictated then by Germany. They declared that such a peace would be fatal to the revolution, that the principle of peace without annexations must not be sacrificed that the German conditions involved the basest treachery to the workers and peasants of the provinces demanded by the Prussians, that the peace would subject the whole of Russia to economic and political dependence upon German imperialism, that the invaders would possess themselves of the Ukrainian bread and the Don coal and drive Russia to industrial ruin. But Lenin's influence was potent. He prevailed. The Brest-Litovsk Treaty was ratified by the Fourth Soviet Congress. It was Trotsky who first asserted, in refusing the German peace terms offered in December 1917, that the workers and peasants, inspired and armed by the revolution, could, by guerrilla warfare, overcome any army of invasion. The left social revolutionists now called for peasant uprisings to oppose the Germans, confident that no army could conquer the revolutionary ardor of a people fighting for the fruits of their great revolution. Workers and peasants responding to this call formed military detachments and rushed to the aid of Ukraine and White Russia, then valiantly struggling against the German invaders. Trotsky ordered the Russian army to pursue and suppress these partisan units. The killing of Merbach followed. It was the protest of the left social revolutionist party against and the defiance of Prussian imperialism within Russia. The Bolshevik government initiated repressive measures. It now felt itself, as it were, under obligations to Germany. Zerzhinsky, head of the All-Russian Extraordinary Commission, demanded the delivery of the terrorist. It was a situation unique in revolutionary annals, a revolutionary party in power demanding of another revolutionary party with which it had till then cooperated the arrest and punishment of a revolutionist for executing the representative of an imperialist government. The Brest-Litovsk peace had put the Bolsheviks in the anomalous position of a gendarme for the Kaiser. The left social revolutionists responded to Zerzhinsky's demand by arresting the latter. This act and the armed skirmishes that followed it, though insignificant in themselves, were thoroughly exploited by the Bolsheviks politically. They declared that it was an attempt of the left social revolutionist party to seize the reins of government. They announced that party outlawed, and their extermination began. These Bolshevik methods and tactics were not accidental. Soon it became evident that it is the settled policy of the communist state to crush every form of expression not in accord with the government. After the ratification of the Brest-Litovsk peace, the left social revolutionist party withdrew its representative in the Soviet of People's Commissars. The Bolsheviks thus remained in exclusive control of the government. Under one pretext and another, there followed most arbitrary and cruel suppressions of all the other political parties and movements. The Mensheviks and right social revolutionists had been liquidated long before, together with the Russian bourgeoisie. 
Now it was the turn of the revolutionary elements, the left social revolutionists, the anarchists, the non-partisan revolutionists. But the liquidation of these involved much more than the suppression of small political groups. These revolutionary elements had strong followings, the left social revolutionists among the peasantry, the anarchists mainly among the city proletariat. The new Bolshevik tactics encompassed systematic eradication of every sign of dissatisfaction, stifling all criticism, and crushing independent opinion or effort. With this phase, the Bolsheviks enter upon the dictatorship over the proletariat, as it is popularly characterized in Russia. The government's attitude to the peasantry is now that of open hostility. More increasingly is violence resorted to. Labor unions are dissolved, frequently by force, when their loyalty to the Communist Party is suspected. The cooperatives are attacked. This great organization, the fraternal bond between city and country, whose economic functions were so vital to the interests of Russia and of the revolution, is hindered in its important work of production, exchange, and distribution of the necessaries of life. It is disorganized. And finally, it is completely abolished. Arrests, night searches, house blockade, executions are the order of the day. The Extraordinary Commissions, or Cheka, originally organized to fight counter-revolution and speculation, is becoming the terror of every worker and peasant. Its secret agents are everywhere, always unearthing plots, signifying the rastrel, shooting, of hundreds without hearing, trial, or appeal. From the intended defense of the revolution, the Cheka becomes the most dreaded organization, whose injustice and cruelty spread terror over the whole country. All-powerful, owing no one responsibility, the Cheka is a law unto itself, possesses its own army, assumes police, judicial, administrative, and executive powers, and makes its own laws that supersede those of the official state. The prisons and concentration camps are filled with alleged counter-revolutionists and speculators, 95% of whom are starved workers, simple peasants, and even children of 10 to 14 years of age. See reports of prison investigations, Petrograd Krasnaya Gazeta and Pravda, Moscow Pravda, May, June, July, 1920. Communism becomes synonymous in the popular mind with Czechism, the latter the epitome of all that is vile and brutal. The seed of counter-revolutionary feeling is sown broadcast. The other policies of the revolutionary government keep step with these developments. Mechanical centralization run mad is paralyzing the industrial and economic activities of the country. Initiative is frowned upon, free effort systematically discouraged. The great masses are deprived of the opportunity to shape the policies of the revolution or take part in the administration of the affairs of the country. The government is monopolizing every avenue of life. The revolution is divorced from the people. A bureaucratic machine is created that is appalling in its parasitism, inefficiency, and corruption. In Moscow alone, this new class of Sovors, or Soviet bureaucrats, exceeds in 1920 the total of office holders throughout the whole of Russia under the Tsar in 1914. See Official Report of Investigation by Committee of Moscow Soviet, 1921. The Bolshevik economic policies, effectively aided by this bureaucracy, completely disorganized the already crippled industrial life of the country. Lenin, Zinoviev, and other communist leaders thunder philippics against the new Soviet bourgeoisie and issue ever new decrees that strengthen and augment its numbers and influence. The system of Yedinolichia is introduced, management by one person. Lenin himself is its originator and chief advocate. Henceforth, the shop and factory committees are to be abolished, stripped of all power. Every mill, mine, and factory, the railroads, and all other industries are to be managed by a single head, a specialist, and the old czarist bourgeoisie is invited to step in. The former bankers, bourse operators, mill owners, and factory bosses become the managers in full control of the industries with absolute power over the workers. They are vested with authority to hire, employ, and discharge the hands, to give or deprive them of the feok, food ration, even to punish them and turn them over to the cheka. The workers who had fought and bled for the revolution and were willing to suffer, freeze, and starve in its defense resent this unheard of imposition. They regard it as the worst betrayal. They refused to be dominated by the very owners and foremen whom they had driven in the days of revolution out of the factories and who had been so lordly and brutal to them. They have no interest in such a reconstruction. The new system, heralded by Lenin as the savior of the industries, results in the complete paralysis of the economic life of Russia, drives the workers en masse from the factories, and fills them with bitterness and hatred of everything socialistic. 
the principles and tactics of Marxian mechanization of the revolution are sealing its doom. The fanatical delusion that a little conspirative group, as it were, could achieve a fundamental social transformation proved the Frankenstein of the Bolsheviks. It led them to incredible depths of infamy and barbarism. The methods of such a theory, its inevitable means, are twofold, decrees and terror. Neither of these did the Bolsheviks spare. As Bukharin, the foremost ideologue of the militant communists, taught, terrorism is the method by which capitalistic human nature is to be transformed into fit Bolshevik citizenship. Freedom is a bourgeois prejudice, Lenin's favorite expression. Liberty of speech and of the press, unnecessary, harmful. The central government is the depository of all knowledge and wisdom. It will do everything. The sole duty of the citizen is obedience. The will of the state is supreme. Stripped of fine phrases intended mostly for Western consumption, this was, and is, the practical attitude of the Bolshevik government. This government, the real and only actual government of Russia, consists of five persons, members of the inner circle of the Central Committee of the Communist Party of Russia. These big five are omnipotent. This group, in its true essence conspiratory, has been controlling the fortunes of Russia and of the revolution since the Brest-Litovsk peace. What has happened in Russia since has been in strict accord with the Bolshevik interpretation of Marxism. That Marxism, reflected through the communist inner circle's megalomania of omniscience and omnipotence, has achieved the present debacle of Russia. In consonance with their theory, the social fundamentals of the October Revolution have been deliberately destroyed. The ultimate object being a powerfully centralized state with the P Communist Party in absolute control, the popular initiative and the revolutionary creative forces of the masses had to be eliminated. The elective system was abolished, first in the army and navy, then in the industries. The Soviets of peasants and workers were castrated and turned into obedient communist committees with the dreaded sword of the Cheka ever hanging over them. The labor unions governmentalized, their proper activities suppressed, they were turned into mere transmitters of the orders of the state. Universal military service, coupled with the death penalty for conscientious objectors, enforced labor with a vast officialdom for the apprehension and punishment of deserters. Agrarian and industrial conscription of the peasantry, military communism in the cities, and the system of requisitioning in the country, characterized by Radek as simply grain plundering, International Press Correspondence, English Edition, Volume 1, Number 17. The suppression of workers' protests by the military, the crushing of peasant dissatisfaction with an iron hand, even to the extent of whipping the peasants and raising their villages with artillery in the Ural, Volga, and Kuban districts in Siberia and the Ukraine. This characterized the attitude of the communist state toward the people. This comprised the constructive social and economic policies of the Bolsheviks. Still, the Russian peasants and workers, prizing the revolution for which they had suffered so much, kept bravely fighting on numerous military fronts. They were defending the revolution as they thought. They starved, froze, and died by the thousands, in the fond hope that the terrible things the communists did would soon cease. The Bolshevik horrors were, somehow, the simple Russian thought, the inevitable result of the powerful enemies from abroad attacking their beloved country. But when the wars will at last be over, the people naively echoed the official press. The Bolsheviks will surely return to the revolutionary path they entered in October 1917, the path the wars had forced them, temporarily, to forsake. The masses hoped, and endured. Then, at last, the wars were ended. Russia drew an almost audible sigh of relief, relief palpitating with deep hope. It was the crucial moment. The great test had come. The soul of a nation was a quiver, to be or not to be. And then full realization came. The people stood aghast, repressions continued, even grew worse. The piratical Razvorska, the punitive expeditions against the peasants, did not abate their murderous work. The Cheka were unearthing more conspiracies. Executions were taking place as before. Terrorism was rampant. The new Bolshevik bourgeoisie lorded it over the workers and the peasants. Official corruption was vast and open. Huge food supplies were rotting through Bolshevik inefficiency and centralized state monopoly. And the people were starving. The Petrograd workers, always in the forefront of revolutionary effort, were the first to voice their dissatisfaction and protest. The Kronstadt sailors, upon investigation of the demands of the Petrograd proletariat, declared themselves solidaric with the workers. In their turn, they announced their stand for free Soviets, Soviets free from communist coercion, Soviets that should, in reality, represent the revolutionary masses and voice their needs. In the middle provinces of Russia, in the Ukraine, 
on the Caucasus, in Siberia, everywhere, the people made known their wants, voiced their grievances, informed the government of their demands. The Bolshevik state replied with its usual argument. The Kronstadt sailors were decimated, the bandits of Ukraine massacred, the rebels of the East lay low with machine guns. This done, Lenin announced at the 10th Congress of the Communist Party of Russia, March 1921, that his former policies were all wrong. The Razvyotska, the requisition of food, was pure robbery. Military violence against the peasantry, a serious mistake. The workers must receive some consideration. The Soviet bureaucracy is corrupt and criminal, a huge parasite. The methods we have been using have failed. The people, especially the rural population, are not yet up to the level of communist principles. Private ownership must be reintroduced, free trade established. Henceforth, the best communist is he who can drive the best bargain. Lenin's Expression Chapter 5 Back to capitalism. The present situation in Russia is most anomalous. Economically, it is a combination of state and private capitalism. Politically, it remains the dictatorship of the proletariat, or more correctly, the dictatorship of the inner circle of the Communist Party. The peasantry has forced the Bolsheviks to make concessions to it. Forcible requisitioning is abolished. Its place has taken the tax in kind, a certain percentage of the peasant produce going to the government. Free trade has been legalized, and the farmer may now exchange or sell his surplus to the government, to the re-established cooperatives, or on the open market. The new economic policy opens wide the door of exploitation. It sanctions the right of enrichment and of wealth accumulation. The farmer may now profit by his successful crops, rent more land, and exploit the labor of those peasants who have little land and no horses to work it with. The shortage of cattle and bad harvest in some parts of the country have created a new class of farmhands who hire themselves out to the well-to-do peasant. The poor people migrate from those regions which are suffering from famine and swell the ranks of this class. The village capitalist is in the making. The city worker in Russia today, under the new economic policy, is in exactly the same position as in any other capitalistic country. Free food distribution is abolished, except in a few industries operated by the government. The worker is paid wages and must pay for his necessaries, as in any country. Most of the industries, insofar as they are active, have been let or leased to private persons. The small capitalist now has a free hand. He has a large field for his activities. The farmer's surplus, the product of the industries, of the peasant trades, and of all the enterprises of private ownership, are subject to the ordinary processes of business. They can be bought and sold. Competition within the retail trade leads to incorporation and to the accumulation of fortunes in the hands of individuals. Developing city capitalism and village capitalism cannot long coexist with dictatorship of the proletariat. The unnatural alliance between the latter and foreign capitalism will, in the near future, prove another vital factor in the fate of Russia. The Bolshevik government still strives to uphold the dangerous delusion that the revolution is progressing, that Russia is ruled by proletarian Soviets, that the Communist Party and its state are identical with the people. It is still speaking in the name of the proletariat. It is seeking to dupe the people with a new chimera. After a while, the Bolsheviks now pretend, when Russia shall have become industrially resurrected through the achievements of our fast-growing capitalism, the proletarian dictatorship will also have grown strong, and we will return to nationalization. The state will then systematically curtail and supplant the private industries, and thus break the power of the meanwhile developed bourgeoisie. After a period of partial denationalization, a stronger nationalization begins, says Preobrazhensky, finance commissar, in his recent article, The Perspectives of the New Economic Policy. Then will socialism be victorious on the entire front. Radek is less diplomatic. We certainly do not mean, he assures us in his political analysis of the Russian situation, entitled Is the Russian Revolution a Bourgeois Revolution?, International Press Correspondence, 16th December 1921, that at the end of the year we shall again confiscate the newly accumulated goods. Our economic policy is based upon a longer period of time. We are consciously preparing ourselves for cooperating with the bourgeoisie. This is undoubtedly dangerous to the existence of the Soviet government, because the latter loses the monopoly on industrial production as against the peasantry. Does not this signify the decisive victory of capitalism? May we not then speak of our revolution as having lost its revolutionary character? To these very timely and significant questions, Radek cheerfully answers with a categoric no. 
It is true, of course, as Marx taught, he admits, that economic relations determine the political ones, and that economic concessions to the bourgeoisie must lead also to political concessions. He remembers that when the powerful landowning class of Russia began making economic concessions to the bourgeoisie, those concessions were soon followed by political ones, and finally by the capitulation of the landowning class. But he insists that the Bolsheviks will retain their power even under the conditions of the restoration of capitalism. The bourgeoisie is a historically deteriorating, dying class. That is why the working class of Russia can refuse to make political concessions to the bourgeoisie, since it is justified in hoping that its power will grow on a national and international scale more quickly than will the power of the Russian bourgeoisie. Meanwhile, though authoritatively assured that his power is to grow on a national and international scale, the Russian worker is in a bad plight. The new economic policy has made the proletarian dictator a common everyday wage slave, like his brother in countries unblessed with socialist dictatorship. The curtailment of the government's national monopoly has resulted in the throwing of hundreds of thousands of men and women out of work. Many Soviet institutions have been closed. The remaining ones have discharged from 50 to 75 percent of their employees. The large influx to the cities of peasants and villagers ruined by the Razvirska and those fleeing from the famine districts has produced an unemployment problem of threatening scope. The revival of the industrial life through private capital is a very slow process, due to the general lack of confidence in the Bolshevik state and its promises. But when the industries will again begin to function, more or less systematically, Russia will face a very difficult and complex labor situation. Labor organizations, trade unions, do not exist in Russia, so far as the legitimate activities of such bodies are concerned. The Bolsheviks abolished them long ago. With developing production and capitalism, governmental as well as private, Russia will see the rise of a new proletariat whose interests must naturally come into conflict with those of the employing class. A bitter struggle is imminent, a struggle of a twofold nature, against the private capitalist and against the state as an employer of labor. It is even probable that the situation may develop still another phase, antagonism of the workers employed in the state-owned industries toward the better-paid workers of private concerns. What will be the attitude of the Bolshevik government? The object of the new economic policy is to encourage, in every way possible, the development of private enterprise and to accelerate the growth of industrialism. Shops, mines, factories, and mills have already been leased to capitalists. Labor demands have a tendency to curtail profits. They interfere with the orderly processes of business. And as for strikes, they handicap production, paralyze industry. Shall not the interests of capital and labor be declared solidaric in Bolshevik Russia? The industrial and agrarian exploitation of Russia under the new economic policy must inevitably lead to the growth of a powerful labor movement. The workers' organizations will unite and solidify the city proletariat with the agrarian poor in the common demand for better living conditions. From the present temper of the Russian worker, now enriched by his four years' experience of the Bolshevik regime, it may be assumed with considerable degree of probability that the coming labor movement of Russia will develop along syndicalist lines. This sentiment is strong among the Russian workers. The principles and methods of revolutionary syndicalism are not unfamiliar to them. The effective work of the factory and shop committees, the first to initiate the industrial expropriation of the bourgeoisie in 1917, is an inspiring memory still fresh in the minds of the proletariat. Even in the Communist Party itself, among its labor elements, the syndicalist idea is popular. The famous labor opposition, led by Shlyapnikov and Madame Kolontai within the party, is essentially syndicalistic. What attitude will the Bolshevik government take to the labor movement about to develop in Russia, be it wholly or even only partly syndicalistic? Till now, the state has been the mortal enemy of labor syndicalism within Russia, though encouraging it in other countries. At the 10th Congress of the Russian Communist Party, March 1921, Lenin declared merciless warfare against the faintest symptom of syndicalist tendencies, and even the discussion of syndicalist theories was forbidden the communists on pain of exclusion from the party, see official report, 10th Congress. A number of the labor opposition were arrested and imprisoned. It is not to be lightly assumed that the communist dictatorship could satisfactorily solve the difficult problems arising out of a real labor movement under Bolshevik autocracy. They involve principles of Marxian centralization, the functioning of trade or industrial unions independent of the omnipotent government, and active opposition to private capitalism. But not only the big and small capitalists will the workers of Russia soon have to fight, they will presently come to grips with state capitalism itself. 
So, to correctly understand the spirit and character of the present Bolshevik phase, it is necessary to realize that the so-called new economic policy is neither new nor economic properly considered. It is old political Marxism, the exclusive fountainhead of Bolshevik wisdom. As social democrats, they have remained faithful to their Bible. Only a country where capitalism is most highly developed can have a social revolution. That is the acme of Marxist faith. The Bolsheviks are about to apply it to Russia. True, in the October days of the revolution, they repeatedly deviated from the straight and narrow path of Marx, not because they doubted the prophet, by no means. Rather, that Lenin and his group, political opportunists, had been forced by irresistible popular aspiration to steer a truly revolutionary course. But all the time they hung onto the skirts of Marx and sought every opportunity to direct the revolution into Marxian channels. As Raddick naively reminds us, Already in April 1918, in a speech by Comrade Lenin, the Soviet government attempted to define our next tasks and to point out the way which we now designate as the new economic policy. International Press Correspondence, Volume 1, Number 17. Significant admission. In truth, present Bolshevik policies are the continuation of the good Orthodox Bolshevik Marxism of 1918. Bolshevik leaders now admit that the revolution in its post-October developments was only political, not social. The mechanical centralization of the communist state, it must be emphasized, proved fatal to the economic and social life of the country. Violent party dictatorship destroyed the unity of the workers and the peasants and created a perverted, bureaucratic attitude to revolutionary reconstruction. The complete denial of free speech and criticism, not only to the masses, but even to the rank and file of the communist party itself, resulted in its undoing through its own mistakes. And now, Bolshevik Marxism is continuing in poor Russia but it is monstrously criminal to prolong this bloody comedy of errors. Communist construction is not possible alongside of a sickly capitalism artificially developed. That capitalism can never be destroyed, as Lenin and company pretend to believe, by the regular processes of the Bolshevik state grown economically strong. The new policies are therefore a delusion and a snare, fundamentally reactionary. These policies themselves create the necessity for another revolution. Must tortured humanity ever tread the same vicious circle? Or will the workers at last learn the great lesson of the Russian Revolution that every government, whatever its fine name and nice promises, is by its inherent nature as a government destructive of the very purposes of the social revolution? It is the mission of government to govern, to subject, to strengthen and perpetuate itself. It is high time that workers learn that only their own organized, creative efforts, free from political and state interference, can make their age-long struggle for emancipation a lasting success. This has been a production of Audible Anarchist. You can find more Audible Anarchist on YouTube.